Thank you all for joining uh, today's masterclass session. I'm pleased to introduce our faculty, Professor Manpreet Thora and his co-panelist, Colonel Raji Parker. Professor Manpreet Thora is an asset professor at Georgia Institute of Technology, USA, and a visiting faculty at Indian School of Business. He has more than three decades of experience across industry and academia. Colonel Raji Bhargava is a senior associate director at ISP and an alum of PGP class of 2011. You can put your questions in the chat box. Time permitting, we will let you voice your questions. Over to Professor Manpreet Thora for his talk on today's topics, service sanitization, service selling products through services. All right. Uh, give me a thumbs up, Amir, if you can hear me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for me making me a part of this masterclass. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, folks from wherever, whichever part of the world you're joining from. My name is Manpreet Thora, and the intent today is to talk about a topic which sort of reminds us that the lines are blurring between products and services. And the word servitization that you see on your screen is it will sort of hammer home the point is we companies that are trying to sell products, make products, may be moving towards services as well. So in essence, customers in several products, be it physical, be it digital, be it business to business, be it business to consumers, may be interested as customers in the functionality of the product, in the utility of the product, rather than just the product per se. So once again, welcome. And the topic is servitization, selling products through services. Uh, my main outline for the next half hour is to pick up three examples to motivate this topic of servitization. Servitization, a made up word. Servitization, which if you look in the dictionary, may not be there existing but it's talking of services and products and bringing them together. And in doing so, we will try and look at some observations with examples from different industries. And we will then try to give a definition, a sort of a incomplete definition to servitization, and then start bringing the onset of it. Then think about, discuss, what are the enablers uh, of servitization? Well, it, it's a great topic. It can be a competitive advantage, but it comes with a lot of challenges. So we want to finish by reminding us that servitization, while having an opportunity and potential for competitive advantage, brings out its challenge as well. And then leave the remaining time for question and answers. So let's pick up some examples of servitizations to build up some observations. First. Caterpillar. Now, Caterpillar is a world-renowned company in heavy machinery. A majority of us attending this know Caterpillar is into uh, heavy earth-moving equipment. And you see the picture there on the left side of the screen uh, where you see the word written cat uh, right now in yellow. We see a lot of these machinery around uh, expressways, around highways, when a lot of construction is happening around us. So Caterpillar, this is taken from the 2018 annual report. In 2018, the annual uh, report, their, about their turnover was about $54 billion with a B for fiscal year uh, 2018. Of that, 18 billion came from services. I repeat, for this heavy machinery company, which leases out cells, heavy machinery, like earth moving equipment, bulldozers, uh, agricultural based uh, aspects. And what you read on the screen is, they have started a telematic service, which has made easy to monitor individual machines, whole fleets and entire job sites. And doing so the telematics technology uh, gets operators to be more productive. This extends their rental and use business. Why? Because the demand 
for a product is shifting from ownership to usership. So please keep that in mind. Ownership to usership, taken from Caterpillar. First example. Second, a very different industry called Philips Lighting. Here we were in a very capital intensive industry called Caterpillar. Let's move to Philips Lighting, which you know all of us need LED lights in our houses, at airports, in warehouses, in universities, in hospitals, in hotels. What Philips Lighting has done is they've offered, rather than buying lights, bulbs, LEDs, and replacing them ourselves as companies, they have tried to enter this business-to-business -business space by offering lighting as a service. And what they're telling the, their clients is, you don't have to expend money in, as capital expenditure. Take it as an operating expenditure. That's why you see the word written there, lighting industry, by enabling a market shift to an OPEX model. And in this operating model, they will take care of your maintenance of your lights. They will have sensors there. They will replace them before they need replacement. They will repair them. They will maintain them. And in return, they are not charging you uh, as Philips. They're not charging you for lights, but they're charging you for the service. So lighting is a service so much so it's become a large company. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of Philips Lighting and is now Signify. Signify is still trying to make inroads. It's been there since 2010 from Philips Lighting. It's still uh, trying to find a, a customer base to make the client sticky. However, they have started a business by looking at warehouses, by looking at airports, by looking at factories, and have taken over this business of lighting as a service. So that's the second example, Caterpillar and Philips slash Signify. Two examples from the business to business industry. Let's look at an example from the business to consumer industry. Nike, company sells shoes. We buy shoes over time, either the size changes for kids, you replace shoes, or we want to buy our joggers. We may want to buy shoes for casual walking. As that changes, Nike is trying to experiment and try to servitize the product by looking, look at the headlines that says that. How on the top left says how Nike is using analytics to personalize the customer experience. Nike launches sneaker subscription service, betting convenience is equal to sales. So they're getting into this model of where they are giving a subscription service and you can sort of replace shoes as well. They are investing a lot into data science and demand sensing to understand the subscription business. And the examples from Caterpillar, examples from Philips Class Signify, examples from Nike, bring out some observations, folks. First observation, companies are transitioning from rather than just being a product to offer product as a service. And if you see the picture of product as a service, cloud-based uh, services have really helped us do that. But as you look at this, please keep a couple of things in mind. This picture of key observation one transitions either through a digital product to a physical product. It translates or transitions from a business to business environment to a business to consumer environment. So this phenomena of product as a service or as a service economy is ours. We have to be as creative as possible to take it forward. That's key observation one from those three examples. Key observation two is firms that where there was a dominance of manufacturing are moving towards shifting to dominance of service. Because if you think of the word servitization, some of you are sitting there and saying, you know what, this doesn't sound as new as I'm trying to make it from 1970s 1980s, Xerox has been offering us services. IBM has, has started to have was offering us services. However, please keep in mind there there was dominance of services and services, uh, sorry, dominance of manufacturing and services was an add-on. However, we've moved along to see dominance of services and goods as an add-on. Yes, we need the underlying product, no question about it. That's why the word productization to servitization exists. However, 
companies where there were services as an add-on, service was, was seen as a cost center. When you have dominance of services, services are seen as a value center. And that's a extremely changing organizational mindset. It's an extremely changing business model that's transformed. So organizations, while in the 70s and 80s, were still leasing, were still renting, but that business was from the current position where they were, if it's coming to the target position here, there are aspects of operational capabilities that organizations need to go through, they need to build upon. That's key observation two. Key observation one was transitioning from being a product to a product as a service, irrespective digital or physical, irrespective business to business or business to consumer. Key observation two, you can take, as I said, the lines are blurred between manufacturing and services. We have to see it as a, as a continuum. Within those continuums, we want to see service as a value center, and we want to change our operational capabilities accordingly. Key observation number three. And from the operations and supply chain, if you have the product where you want to servitize, please do not think of service ch uh, supply chains to be linear. You have to think of them to be iterative. So what this picture is showing to us is, if you start up thinking of raw materials, going clockwise to transport, to production, to adding value-added services, to warehousing, to distribution, and then finally to returns, in all that aspect, we got to keep the customer in mind. So in the concentric circle, you've got to put the customer there. And as a result of servitization, all those elements that you bring in your end-to-end -end service in your supply chain, the customer has to be there. Not only has the, has the customer to be there, folks, the customer, we have to make the customer sticky. So we got to give some satisfaction to the customer to make the customer satisfied and loyal. So that's the third observation. We've talked of three examples and three observations. Now let's take it forward to say, what are the elements of servitization? If I had to give a definition to servitization, what is it? And what are the characteristics that servitization exhibits? First, you see the word written there, functionality. Servitization is trying to sell the functionality of the product rather than just the product itself. Think of software as a service, platform as a service. What stops us to think of Caterpillar as a service, where they have heavy machinery as a service? What stops us of thinking of Philips as lighting as a service? What stops us of thinking Nike to having footwear as a service? And we can think of several industries where we can bring this aspect here. So the, the challenge is to be creative, to build a business model around it. But keeping in mind, we are trying to exhibit the functionality. Number two, where you see product owner written. The ownership in some capital intensive business are retained by the manufacturer. So there may be an underlying product, be it digital, be it physical, but the ownership is, uh, is maintained slash retained by the manufacturer, which changes your mindset. So remember, once you do that, what changes? You're not selling more products. You're selling more services. So you want your products to be more durable. Hey, why? Because you own them as a, uh, as a supplier. You're not selling the product, you're selling the functionality of the product. You want your products to be more sustainable because you're selling the functionality rather than the product itself. So if your product performs, that's when you are paid because remember there has to be a contract of how you're going to be paid. Finally, you see the word in the maintenance and repairs. So if the products, i.e. going back to Caterpillar, going to Nike, going to Philips, the maintenance and repairs is done by the manufacturer slash uh, the product owner slash the supplier. So those are the, think about that to be the definition of the, of servitization. Selling functionality rather than just the product, retaining ownerships and taking care of maintenance and repairs. 
So from a customer's perspective, customer is paying you half. They're not, they're paying you maybe on usage, maybe they're paying you a monthly subscription. Think about us, we may be using iCloud as a service. You may be using uh, Google Cloud as a service. You may be using uh, Netflix as a service where entertainment is delivered to you as a service. So you are paying a charge for that. Key focus is I quote on customer value uh, rather than the product itself. Finally, product is required like any platform to deliver that value. But please pay attention to the word value. So talking of the key elements of servitizations, which came from the observations, which came from the examples, the onset of servitization. I'll pause and let you read this very nice quote from Professor Theodore Levitt from the Harvard Business School. And this is a nice quote which says, if you think about you going to a hardware store to get a drill, and the reason you get a drill is not because you may want the drill. You may actually want to put a painting on, the, on your wall. And because of the painting, you need a hole on the wall. And because you need a hole on the wall, you need the, uh, the drill. So if organizations think of the end utility of the, the customer or the client, that helps you go back and say, where can I build the value proposition? So the product, you still need the drill. However, uh, the drill is required because there is a value that the customer needs. And the customer may be drilling themselves. They may be getting a help from a handy person to build it, or uh, they may be using the organization themselves. So this gives a series of services that can come up if you think of the value proposition. So this is not something new. Professor uh, Levitt said it uh, in the 70s, but the spirit holds on the onset of servitization. Now, what are the enablers to make this happen? So if you think of uh, servitization that's happening, the elements of servitization, and we are living in an as-a-service economy, as we live in an as-a-service economy, what sort of enablers do we need? I'll start with on the bottom, on the top left called emerging technologies and go counterclockwise to capture reach. One is think of how much uh, velocity, variety, and volume of data we have. So that emerging technologies with automation, with digitization, with machine learning has enabled as a tool slash infrastructure to enable us to give as a service economy. We are living in an environment where we use the word industry 4.0, and that emerging technology has given us IOTs, has given us sensors to build on those. Second is going counterclockwise, the world we live in. The world's becoming really small with using technology. It, was, it became prevalent during the pandemic. People were taking Zoom classes from all around the world, this particular class or master class is an example of how we are sitting all around the world and we are connecting together in the world we live in. Expertise can lie in different places. Once a product is digitized, once a service needs to be offered, the world we live in is the production side and the consumption side has enabled us to do that. Enabling talent. We, if we want to build an as a service economy, a key enabler has to be talent. Remember, if you're a manufacturing company and if I'm Caterpillar, the people who make the machines are not the ones who sell the machines. But now, because you're not selling the machines, you retain the ownership of the machine uh, because you're selling servitization rather than the product, you need your sales force also to know about engineering. So you have to create not a sales savvy sales force, you need a service savvy sales force. So that talent has to be elevated to the level of as you're changing your operating model slash platform. That's the last point uh, as I go counterclockwise to enable as a service economy. Your operating models and your platforms have changed. You are now charging for performance. You're not charging for materials. You're not charging for time. You're not charging for how much you've sold, how much time you've given. 
that now you're charging for if your clients do well because your products, your machines performed well for them is the performance aspect has built up. So please keep the enablers in mind, emerging technologies, the world we live in, enabling talent, operating models and platforms. Moving from talking about elements of servitizations to enablers of servitizations, let me pick up an example. I wrote a research article earlier this year uh, where uh, I called it how companies have moved from scarcity to abundance. And I apologize, this is a pretty cluttered slide, but please bear with me. I want to highlight a couple of points here. So let's go back 20, 30 years ago. And some of you may be really young compared to that. But uh, you know, I lived in an environment where we would have video cassette players and video cassette recorders, and we would have to put in VHS tapes to watch any entertainment. So where was the scarcity and value coming in? If the new movie came out, let's say a new Star Wars came out, I wanted that VHS tape as quickly as possible to watch. But guess what? There were a, a series of limited VHS tapes. So there was scarcity. I had to go into an in-store rental shop. I could get some DVDs when we moved from VHS to DVD. But now comes Netflix, and now I don't need a DVD or a VHS. There is no scarcity. There is abundance of content. As long as they have the content, they have created the content, the value proposition is not coming from scarcity anymore. The value proposition is coming from the recommendation engine they have. The value proposition is coming from, can I use the same uh, Netflix as an app on my different devices? Can I continue by watching on my tablet, to watching on my phone, to watching on my computer, to be watching on my projector as long as it's all Wi-Fi enabled? Bingo. So my model has changed from scarcity where ownership was important to abundance where usership is important. The fourth column, folks, talks of what does the organization need to change to build that capability. And you can see in a digital product world, in a business to consumer setting, that's what the header is. You can think of Netflix, Spotify, Microsoft 365, Wikipedia. And I build models, sorry, tables like this for the digital business to consumer world, digital business to business world, physical business to consumer world, and physical business to uh, business world. So this is just an example uh, that's coming out to show you the value proposition that's changed and what the organizations need to change. Transitioning from the key enabler slide. So if companies transition towards service servitization, what should they keep in mind? I would say if you think of any time we offer excellence, this is an oversimplified slide. If you offer excellence, you need to think of the three Ps, a cliche three Ps for building service excellence. One, it's what is customer value? So I call that purpose. Anytime we transition from being a product-based company, be it physical, be it digital, be it business to business, be it business to consumer, what is the purpose? How are we enhancing customer value while minimizing our own operational risk. Anytime we move transition from selling a product to selling functionality of the product uh, becomes servitization, it comes with inherent risks. How can we minimize those risks? That's purpose. Second, how do we reorient our processes? Because that we'll need to do, we will need to build that to enable that. Finally, our, pro our product, our functionality is as good as our people and our technology. So we need to engage our employees. We need to maybe to retrain them, motivate them, retain them to give customer value. So if you build a triangle, I'll have purpose on the top. On the right side, I'll have process. On the left side, I'll have a people, and it'll be a bi-directional triangle. So please keep in mind, as we move to servitization, let's not forget the element of service excellence. Yeah. However, 
Uh, given that, I, I want to spend another four or five minutes to wrap up this topic and then have time for Q&A, is if servitization is important, a lot of companies are moving into servitization, what's a little blur and not uh, clear cut is, do companies always have benefits of moving into servitization? So let's pick up a couple of examples where it may have not gotten as expected where the organizations thought it's going to go. While servitization is selling functionality of the product, a lot of companies want to be on that bandwagon to sell functionality of the product, but the competitive advantage is not clear because delivering customer value as you are changing from value from products to value from services may be not that clear cut. Why? I picked up the Nike example. That was before the pandemic or during the pandemic, 2019. Well, in 2020, they said Nike Adventure Club, the end or just the beginning of footwear subscriptions. They're still experimenting. It did not be adopted the way they thought it's going to be adopted. So, so that becomes an important point to think of anytime we offer or start some sort of a servitization, if the adoption by the customers may not be as immediate as one purports as an organization it's going to be. So uh, it, the customer value uh, is the aspect that may be challenging. Second, on the good side, the, the writing you see there from the Wall Street Journal is a cloud search lifts Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Amazon is an e-commerce company, but it gets a lot of its revenue it accrues this from this business called AWS, Amazon Web Services. And that's helped them uh, elevate slash lift their results uh, in terms of revenue and profitability. There are a lot of businesses in rentals, uh, which are examples of subscription-based model. An example from the US is called Rent the Runway. And this, they sell a lot of high fashion good items. Maybe you want something for your wedding. They will rent it out because you just want to, you may not want to own that bridal gown or, or a, a men's suit for perpetuity or entirety of your life. You just want it for that event. So you can rent it out. But because of COVID, that became a challenge for that business because, hey, not many events were happening. So they had to think beyond rentals, which was their servitization business. So while the answer is not clear cut, what do we want to know more? We've just scratched the service in a master class talking of servitization. We've set it up, but as an organization, what extra questions should we be talking about as we build a toolkit, folks? I broke them down into three levels. Supply chain, firm, and customer. Looking at supply chain that you're seeing in blue is what I somewhat hit at is we need to step back and categorize. In our business model, are we looking at B2B in a business to business? Are we looking at business to consumers? How are we going to create our contracts? Our earlier contracts were built more on delivering products, charging for products. How are the contracts going to look like now? And while downstream, we can do that with our customers slash clients, what are we going to do upstream with our, sub our suppliers? Do we want to build a servitization model with them as well? Would the supply chain configurations look different for digital products versus physical products? And finally, do we need to create as we move into servitization, do we need to create an ecosystem or does it exist that we plug into? So that's from the supply chain perspective. From firm level perspective, uh, we have to see how are we going to manage the capital expenditure versus op operating expenditure. CapEx versus OpEx is an important aspect for clients in mind. So that would be something for, to consider as we move into transitioning from products into services. Please keep the role of experimentation in mind. As we saw the examples, not everything is clear cut. Certain things may work 
Certain things may require some fine tuning. There may be trial and error that's happening. What will be service delivery? Will service delivery change as we have a servitization model compared to a product model? How would the design of the product change now that we are retaining ownership as a supplier slash manufacturer? What about the environmental impact? Because in a way you control as a, as a supplier slash manufacturer, you take ownership of the product. So it's your footprint of the environment. So you have to create some sort of and a sustainable closed loop supply chain or circular economy. Is your model scalable? Hopefully it is, but you've got to keep scalability in mind, even though they may be physical products versus digital products. Finally, before we move to customer level, how are we going to acquire customers for this? Are customers ready to jump into this type of a model? Will, are they interested rather than buying a product to move into uh, taking the functionality of the product? And what's their value proposition that you can tell them? From a customer level aspect, the adoption rate becomes really important besides the environmental impact. So these are some flavors we want to know more. Uh, we, when we talk of servitization, to uh, wrap up, what we have talked about from here is we want to sell products, but through services. As we do that, the value proposition is coming from selling the functionality rather than the products. The three examples we talked about include Caterpillar, in a very fixed asset capital intensive industry, to Philips having lighting as a service, which is a continuous product that's required, which uh, needs a different type of a business model. Moving on to Nike subscription services. These give us some observations, folks. Those observations are, we have product as a service rather than a, a product itself. Second key observation is the dominance of services comes important. Services become a value center rather than a cost center. And, and moving on, technology is a great enabler and that's happening. So they are enabling aspects that make us hap this happen. But in doing so, please do not forget the service excellence when we build out servitization. The purpose of enhancing customer value, minimizing operational risk, of building processes for continuous improvement, and engaging the employees and having enabling technology. Thank you so much. I would pause here uh, as some questions are coming up on yeah. this topic of servitization, selling products through services. Yes, Professor, thank you very much for a very powerful presentation. And uh, I must say you have scratched more than the surface and there is going to be a lot of interest by all the listeners. I was really taken up with that uh, one a uh, very great human insight that you brought out that we want a quarter inch hole, not a quarter inch drill. Uh, but one thing I just wanted uh, requested you to also cover in, me, in a very brief, if possible, that as we move towards functionality from product, uh, what happens is that uh, that company, whichever is doing that also needs a lot of capex for itself to get into that area. Uh, and especially small and medium enterprises who wish to get into uh, functionality. Do you have, uh, there must be quite a few of them out here also. Do you have any thoughts on how they can uh, enable that? So, so that's a great question uh, by Colonel Bhargav here is, uh, if you think about taking a step back is while we want to be value driven by the anecdote he just talked about is people are looking at a value from a quarter inch hole rather than a quarter inch drill. Uh, how can companies that have to spend in capital expenditure and more so small and medium sized companies, my suggestion would be as companies are doing it, see where the customer is dri driving value. You are as good as your customers being sticky. And at times uh, I would suggest there are some customers where you can start experimenting with them to try and selling functionality. So before you move on block and on mass by putting capital expenditure, try and see, because you don't have that sort of capital with you, you do, it, it's pretty risky as well. I can understand the Procter and Gambles of the world and the Caterpillars doing it. A small and medium uh, company, which is constantly finance strapped, 
capacity constraint will be challenging. So my suggestion would be to look at your existing clientele and see when you are selling them products, for them, what's the total cost of ownership? I repeat, the word is TCO. Total cost of ownership. And as a result, they if you can convince them saying, if you buy functionality for us, even for some products among the many you're selling to them, and their total cost of ownership will go down because they don't have to take care of procurement, they don't have to take care of logistics. They don't have to take care of inventory. They don't have to take care of maintenance that you are doing as a service provider, be it a small and a medium organization and see what the stickiness or the adoption of the customer is. Because you may be first in your, in your landscape industry to do it. So there is really, first there's a barrier to entry. There is a, maybe a barrier to adoption and it costs more in terms of CapEx. So, I think there are enough ways for organizations to experiment and put it in your R&D budget. Think of research and development. Organizations that have stuck along over time, think of servitization being a part of your R&D, a continuous part of your R&D as you're doing it to sustain yourself as innovation is happening all around us. Be it in products, be it in services, be it in business models, be it in, uh, uh, in services. Thank you. Excellent, sir, Professor. This was awesome. And uh, to the audience, I would like to say one thing. <clears throat> uh, there is more to come uh, from the professor as uh, uh, as we uh, the uh, this uh, series that we are having is part of uh, the program that we are going to launch, and that is the global management program in operations and supply chain on the Coursera platform. Uh, Amir, if you can just very quickly show me the uh, 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 slides uh, as to what are the subjects uh, that we are covering. Uh, while uh, Amir uh, gets the, uh, yeah, he is, okay. Okay, thank you, Amir. Uh, this is uh, good. Uh, so uh, the subjects which are this program is a one-year program in which there are four terms: uh, general management, supply chain strategy and management, operational excellence, emerging trends in operations, and supply chain. Uh, can you go to the next one? Yeah. So the subjects that are covered is. Uh, see, in general management, we have the essentials of management, business analytics, digital leadership, managerial economics, negotiations, strategic change management, leading teams, and marketing strategy, branding, and pricing. In supply chain strategy and management, we have strategic management of operations, supply chain strategy and management, achieving operational excellence, uh, uh, strategic procurement, sustainable operations, and supply chain. We have modeling for business decisions, managing business processes, transformation of operations, and managing service operations, which the professor Manpreet Hora is most likely to be teaching. Uh, then we also have uh, some very futuristic subjects like technology strategy, firm and market level perspectives, emerging topics in operations and supply chain management to include blockchain and uh, deep uh, thinking and so many other things innovation, product design and management, and advanced business analytics. This is a very flexible program. You can do it in one year, or you can also do it over a period of three years based on availability of uh, your time. So we have a very quick two question poll before we go to the Q&A. And we have just two very simple questions which you, we want you to answer. Uh, the question one, and it is just yes, no that will you be interested to attend more masterclass sessions in future uh, as a part of our global management program in operations and supply chain? And, and the second one is, are you interested to apply for the global management program in operations and supply chain? I request you all to very quickly within a minute answer this and we would be very grateful for that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think mo most of you have submitted. 
And now I will request uh, Amir uh, to just check out as to that there are a large number of questions which goes on to show how Professor has really delivered value. Uh, so Amir, I'll request you to just quickly cover um, a few of the questions. Sure, Raja sir. So uh, first question uh, we have from uh, Yogesh. Uh, Yogesh Sharma is asking, uh, how do we measure customer value in servitization? Are there any model developed to measure uh, customer value? Yeah, so I think uh, uh, Yogesh's question is well taken. Customer value is, if you think about the, the value proposition that you're trying to sell, while the value may be different in a business to business setting to a business to consumer setting, but what servitization should be doing, Yogesh, to your point is, we should, the, the continuity of the customer's business should not be hampered. The continuity of your client's business is what you are contributing towards. And that's the first value proposition you're giving them. Because they may be paying a higher price to buying functionality rather than buying a product. While their total, and second, their total cost of ownership should be going down. So cost and effort for them to acquire the service of the supplier or the manufacturer or the product owner should be going down. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the utility coming out from the service. So that's a rule of thumb that one uh, supplier slash manufacturer should keep in mind given customer value. Thank you, Professor. So here, uh, we in the same person has a um, follow-up question. So how uh, he was asking, uh, is servitization only related to manufacturing industry? Any examples of servitization in other industries? Absolutely. Manuf I don't think it's related to manufacturing industry. It's related to a product. That product could be a tangible product. That could be an intangible product. Financial products are intangible. I, if I throw them at your foot, they're not going to hurt you. So as a result, you can offer those financial slash digital products. Netflix has a digital product. I use the word manufacturer very loosely. So I gave the examples, started with Nike, Philips, and Caterpillar, but then I moved on to Netflix, Spotify, Wikipedia as well. So there is an inherent product. Content is a product. Uh, when we start working for large companies, including Facebook, including Netflix, including Google, they have product managers, even though they are in a service business. So to your point, absolutely, yes. It is not limited to manufacturer. The way I was using the word manufacturer is there is an underlying product, tangible or intangible. Thank you, Paul. So uh, Kiran Boyal is asking, uh, how can we translate this to public services? For example, a regulator that is in the sole nation provider of a product and service. That's a great question. That's a great question. I think the uh, uh, larger uh, government services actually do it. Uh, they haven't sort of adopted the model per se, but to your point, uh, they are generally doing it. So think of waste services. Right, you can offer. If you think of waste being garbage being picked up from your houses of all the time, every on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis, you can offer you know garbage collection as a service. Now you can build up a model there where you can use customers to be more engaging. You can move on to thinking of certain other elements of offering as a service model. Government services are offered either through healthcare, either through taxation, or any other non-for-profit organizations, you can pick this as a service model. Please remember, it's not only a product that's physical to the last um, a queries person's point. To your point, this can be elevated to take from a for-profit organization to a not-for-profit organization as well. And, and that's a fantastic question to think about uh, when we are using, there's so many apps we use that may be related to the government services, maybe for social security in different countries, uh, maybe for uh, if you have you want to access your healthcare, maybe because you want to access your taxes. There may be so many underlying products where the service can be offered. Thank you, Amir. 
Thank you, bro. So uh, we have another question. So uh, how are you seeing uh, receptive of customers towards shifting towards uh, product as a service, especially for consumer goods such as TV, dining tables, etc. And how we are going to evaluate the pri pricing of this uh, product as service? A uh, fantastic question. Uh, moving to CPG or even white goods industries, the question that came up is on white goods uh, is on televisions. I mean, I, if you are watching with what's happening, the new I, Apple uh, um, uh, 14 came out uh, and you 14 Pro and 14 normal and 14 Pro Max. You may be noticing this year, while Apple has always been in, in a software as a service model, they have also included hardware as a service model right now. So picking up a TV example now in the US and I'm assuming in other countries as well, you can pay $50 a month, which means that phone is yours for functionality. Apple retains the ownership of the phone. You pay $50 a month. Lo and behold, comes out the new iPhone. You will be replaced with the new iPhone. So you have now capturing because they are trying to build and make the customer sticky. I mean, several, several of us may be wedded to a brand, be it Samsung, be it Apple, uh, in, the, in the telecommunications industry, they have picked up and they've offered hardware as a service. And this goes now, if I pick up your example and take it even further, think of a company like Procter & Gamble. PG has Tide as a detergent, has Dove for... Uh, uh, you know, our uh, uh, needs for personal uh, hygiene needs, they are trying to build with Tide offering laundry as a service. They are trying to capture, they are going downstream and buying dry cleaners and saying they've taken out these very fancy looking Tide pots and they want to capture the laundry business through that. Now, have they been successful? Not really right now, but they have enough uh, R&D expense to experiment. But companies are getting there to experiment Lo and behold, let's leave the Caterpillars aside. Let's leave the Netflix aside. Look at iPhone, look at Procter & Gamble. Seemingly unrelated industries trying to get into servitization. To your second question, how do we price this? And the question becomes uh, really hard for me to answer. Price is going to come from what customer sees as value. Remember, uh, over time, the mega trends that are happening around us, which we did not talk about, uh, servitization, I take those mega trends as given. There is a lot of people who are going to get older. There'll be new services required for them. There are younger people who are going to live in cities. So there's going to be a lot of urbanization. There is going to be a lot of people who will be more sustainability conscious. So given these elements, servitization will be seeing what value they see and your prices will change accordingly. It's not going to be a cost plus uh, you know, some margin element here. Thank you to the caller. Amir? Yeah, thank you, Prof. So uh, next question is, uh, is servitization of services relevant to services of portfolio management? So uh, I'm assuming this portfolio management is coming from the banking industry. Our portfolio is looking at portfolio of, you know, products, which could be equity and bonds. Again, this is my, my presumption as I answer this question. Indeed, if you're offering, if you can think of uh, a service being offered, you can offer portfolio as a service as well. We are indeed doing that. If you're a portfolio manager, you've got your CFA and you're off, you have a business where you have clients, where you're managing their high net wealth or corporate clients or institutional clients, you can offer this as a service as well, where you are charging them based on their performance. Uh, I think that's already happening to a certain extent. It is just not streamlined in that servitization world. But to answer the question of the caller, I absolutely think whatever we are doing, there is more potential to servitize it. Thank you, Prof. So uh, Pamsi is asking, what key challenges may companies experience during transformation from product to product as a service? So the question that's come up is, what are the key challenges to do that? So think of a supplier or a man. Again, I'm using the word manufacturer loosely. I am not very aware of my customer's processes. I sell the product. I may sell it to another product. Now I need to understand the end-to-end -end view. I need to understand 
what my customers' processes look like, how my product that I sell to them is going to be integrated in their processes. Is it going to be as a work in progress for them? Is it going to be a raw material for them? Is it going to be a finished good for them? And as a result, I'll need to change that. I'll need to change my talent. Because remember, my incentive structure for my employees is not selling more products anymore because I'm not selling products anymore. I'm retaining the products. I'm trying to make the customer sticky in different ways by making sure it's running seamlessly. So I'm creating a service savvy force rather than a sales savvy force. Third is what I need to do now is I need to understand my own back office. I need to industrialize and, and, and to integrate it with the downstream client system. And that's not trivial. So these elements, some of them that I've talked about is are the challenges when you move from products to product as a service. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so Anusha is asking, uh, unexpected situations arise such as COVID-19 shortage of raw material in international market, uh, which impact the trade. What would be your contingency plan to lessen uh, the impact on manufacturing? Yeah, so uh, COVID-19 was indeed an aberration, a black swan event. Uh, it has helped us think about how we look at lean operations. And when we talk of service excellence, Anusha, uh, that point of process people and purpose becomes really important. So in a servitization setting, uh, with this aspect of having something where the supply chains and may not be as global we want them to be because of barriers, including the pandemic. Anusha, the one thing we'll need to think about is building redundancies in our systems, building scenario analysis. To, to, your, to your point, which I did not cover in my slide, is anytime you move towards servitization, question by Colonel Bhargav was, what do small and medium companies need to do? You need to build scenario analysis. Because servitization is an interdependent model. Your clients are interdependent on you. And if you do not get your raw material, you will lose those contracts as fast as they came to you. You lose them as fast as you go because your contracts are based on functionality and smooth running of your client's business. So you will need to do a lot of scenario analysis and build redundancies. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so how servitization is different from renting, leasing, or subscription models? Correct. So the, the question here is how is servitization different from a renting, leasing, or subscription models? These models have been existing for a long time. What servitization has done is uh, if I was, let's say I'm renting a car or I'm leasing a photocopier in my office, the, the, mo the model was basically based on the pricing was based on renting for a contract and the company maintained the ownership. What servitization has done is the value has changed. I'm not still leasing the product. I'm not looking at the functionality of the product. I'm changing my value proposition. So the mindset of subscription models, what was there before, is very different. So think about, you know, if we were living in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, for literally picking up the word subscription, we were subscribing Time magazines. We were subscribing Wall Street journals. We were subscribing Times of India. And that subscription was, there was a newspaper delivered or a magazine delivered to us daily or weekly. But the value wasn't in that it was delivered to us in time. The content wasn't a big aspect. Now, when we move towards servitization, the aspect that's become important is the processes, the people and what purpose are we trying to solve for the customer? The end utility of the customer that you're getting. So the earlier models, come, customers could be asset light by not owning a television, by not owning a photocopier, by not owning a car. But we have moved along the continuum where services, remember we shared a slide of dominance of manufacturing and dominance of services. The lines have gotten even further blurred than just saying we are leasing or renting or subscribing. Thank you, Prof. So uh, I think this we could take it as the last question for the day. So Fizur Rahman is asking, uh, what about the cons and threats about moving towards servitization? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question again? What concepts are there to transitioning towards servitization? What about uh, cons and threats? Cons and? Threats. Threats. Uh, while oh, threats. Moving... Yeah, so yes. the challenges that are there to move into a servitization. The first big threat is adoption. Would customers adopt the service? Second is the intent. See, the think of the benefit of offering the services for the service provider is you getting stickiness to the customer. You can forecast your revenues well. So you know going forward, this customer is going to be sticky with you. If you move towards the threat side, uh, the threat for the service provider is you are as good as the data that's integrated. So a lot of times you can only replenish your clients' products, uh, raw materials for them, as long as you have the information. So you have to be constantly updating your technology as your client's technology updates. Second, you will have to keep up retraining your employees to come to that level. Remember, one of them was emerging technologies. Emerging technologies, by definition, are emerging. They keep changing. As means you will have to spend money to use your technologies to elevate to that level as time changes. Because you're not only selling the product, you're selling the functionality of the product. And that challenge becomes third is if there is riskiness, you may not, if the performance of the client is not well, that's a challenge to you because you may not be paid as you would have been paid for materials, time, and labor. Now you're being paid for the functionality of the product. So those are constant existential, existential threats with servitization. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, um, and Amir, before you close, I just want to tell every uh, one, every, every attendee out here that we will be shortly sending out a survey uh, to all of you, a slightly detailed survey. And uh, it would be great, really great for us if you uh, fill it up. It will just take five minutes of your time. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. And Have a nice day Professor, or a good evening. Very much. I think this is a... This is a great presentation, and we can see it from the comments that are coming all the way. Uh, people so thank you for having engaged. an engaging audience as well. I really enjoyed those questions were very probing and are, are very relevant uh, to the topic here. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Professor. Thank you, Colonel Rajiv. So I would like to thank our faculty, Professor Mantri Thora and Colonel Rajiv Agar for their time today. I hope all students enjoyed today's session. Uh, we'll be having such sessions regularly every week and we encourage you to attend them. Thank you and uh, depending upon your time zones, have a great morning, afternoon and evening. Thank you.